So in, in the last few years, the lab has a little bit shifted to a more translational approach in terms that we have investigating the role that maternae can play in diverse tumors. And most of the data I will show today will start usually from profiling tumors, specific subsets of tumors, and I will go through the reason why we profile there. And from there, pick some of the maternae, because historically the lab has been involved in P53, most of our attention has been focused on those macrone that were down-regulated in our analysis, were down-regulated in tumors when we compare these tumors with normal tissue or peritumoral tissues. So I don't think in this audience there is needed to go into what are macroRNAs, but just to say that in these last 10, 15 years, the role of non-coding RNAs has tremendously increased. Also because uh, this non-coding RNA can have an important influence on the coding part. That is not only for macRNA, that maybe now is the oldest class of specific uh, RNA that uh, can control the coding. Again, when we look at the macRNA, as in the past we have already done for the genes, we need in some way to classify them. And maybe we can say that macRNA can be divided in general because then there is the impact of the cell contest that they can switch this activity. But we have two class of macRNA, those that we found down-regulated, and we believe that most of them exert a tumor suppressor activity that is lost and this, of course, result in a wave of uh, oncoproteins, mRNAs. And the other possibility is that there are macRNAs that are upregulated when we compare tumors versus normal tissue, match the normal tissue. And this, of course, one of the effects of this macRNA is to target mRNA that uh, are involved in tumor suppression. And both the combination of the down and up regulation, of course, gives up to cancer, to cancer progression. There is a general consensus, despite no critical evidence has been provided, that the tumor suppression, the down regulation of the tumor suppressor is maybe an early event, while the up regulation of the oncomarine take place in the latest and advanced step, and mainly take place in the metastatization. But this is just, I mean, more physiological difference, but it's not that is really well proven. So this is just a table that resumes some of the most known and most studied tumor suppressor macRNA. These are the targets that have been identified, and these are the function and the main pathway that are involved. And in the last few years, we have worked on this field, and we have identified and attempted to characterize some of the macRNA. And I will briefly go through some of the slides. So originally, we contributed to characterize the MIR-10B locus that was originally described by the group of Bob Weinberg, which provide evidence on the role of macRNA 10B, 5B, and he showed very clearly that this macRNA contributed to the metastatization, and this is a target of twist. These are some of the targets, and this macRNA plays a critical role. A few years ago, we and Francesca Biagioni in the lab was shown that this macRNA can also uh, produce the 3B, the 3P strand. At that time, these strands were called and were known as macRNA marked with the stars. And we were able to show that this macRNA take place in the disabling the proliferation of breast cancer cell. And we like to call this macRNA as the early arm of this macRNA 10B locus. And that was again identified because we profiled breast tumors and they matched normal tissue and we found that this macRNA was downregulated. Uh, these are 
some of the targets that have been shown for the 5P. Again, I say for this macRNA that has been shown to have a critical role in breast cancer metastatization. And these were the three targets that Francesca identified, and you see are very well-known proteins that are involved in the cell proliferation. And the aberrant expression of this protein due in part to the downregulation of this macRNA plays a role. Oh, very recently, we had access to the Metabrick database, the one that was published and set up in Cambridge, in which they have profiled more than 1,000 breast cancer patients and combined the macRNA and mRNA profiling. And we could test that our macRNA has a prognostic value in this database, as well as the three targets that we have discovered as a specific target of the macRNA 10B star. These were already well known. This was uh, unexpected, but made us particularly happy that we could validate in so a big database that this macRNA and its down regulation is a prognostic value. Oh, another macRNA that we have focused is this interesting MIR-204 that you see is a macRNA that plays a pivotal role in development and growing role in cancer. And uh, I won't go into all the details, but what we show was that this uh, macRNA is downregulated in gastric tumors when we compared with the normal tissue. And one of the critical target of this uh, macRNA that we show was BCL2. So the downregulation of this macRNA release up regulation of these anti-apoptotic proteins, and these uh, contribute to the resistance of the <laughs> gastric tumor cells. Uh, let me stress that while gastric tumors is not one of the most frequent tumors, is one, I think, is the third that causes cancer death. So it, this suggests, again, that there is no very effective therapy in treating gastric tumors. This may be we, because we don't know very much about the molecular alteration and the details of the gastric cancer. This is one of the reasons why we approach this problem. And you see, there are a number of targets that have been identified, not only in gastric, but also during the development of ice, that is one of the critical roles in renal cell carcinoma, in pancreatic cancer cells. So it's start to be a robust tumor suppressor that is involved in different type of tumors where it may target different mRNAs. So today, I would mainly focus on the MIR-145, and I will go through a series of evidence in which we have met in many type of tumors the down regulation of the MIR-145 that again gives two gives up to macRNAs, the 5P and the 3P, and I will provide you some evidence on both, and this is in cluster with macRNA-143, that again gives two macRNA, the 3P and the 5P. So the first set of tumors in which we found that the macRNA-145, 5P, was down-regulated was the mesothelioma. Let me stress a little bit the fact that this is a rare tumor, but these almost uh, untreated tumors. The survival of the patients is very low, less than one year, between six years, and it is or will be a critical problem because in 2020, it is expected a big peak of mesothelioma in Europe, in Italy included. This is because the latency of development of these tumors goes between 40 and 60 years. And if we believe that, uh, the, let's say, the dismission of uh, um, all these um, uh, elements that uh, cause this mesothelioma started uh, many years ago, this could explain why we expect that in 2020 will be a big peak. Let me also say, that this is a quite untreated tumors in terms of that we use a still cisplatin, a little bit of Pemetrex, but all the drugs are still employed to face these tumors. This is say that again, maybe there is not much knowledge behind this. So we 
have been able to show that this mu 145 that we found down regulated in three different group of mesothelioma patients, one from the States and two from Italy, uh, compared to normal tissues, so to mesothelium. So when we re-express this mu 145, we were able to reduce cell growth, to reduce the cell migration, to reduce tumor volume, and to induce a sort of a cellular senescence. Let me point out that this cell senescence sometimes also is a productive senescence. And this, this also occurs through the targeting of a critical protein that is involved in Doctor Four is well known protein also involved in EMT and other functions. And again, we were able to show either in cell culture as well as staining the tumors. You see, this is a mesothelioma, this is the expression of OCT4, and this is the benign mesothelial tissue that we could test. And of course, OCT4 re expression antagonizes the near 145 mediated tumor suppression. So that's Again, of course, is one small corner of the long story that uh, is involved in mesothelioma, but is just the characterization how the down regulation of a tumor suppressor macrame can take place and contribute. And also, through pyro sequencing analysis, we were able to show that part or most part of the down regulation of this macrame occurs for promoter methylation. That's, of course, opened the possibility that if we imagine that uh, remove this methylation would contribute to restore the activity of the MIR-145, as well as from other genes, that doesn't mean can also be speculated, could it be an approach. But on this concept, uh, I will back a little bit later. So another group of samples in which we found this 145 is another tumors that is not so aggressive tumors, is thymic epithelial tumors. And again, here we could combine a different uh, group of tumors that came from different hospital, and we were able to reach a very uh, important number for these rare tumors, and we also could, com uh, uh, could compare with the normal tissue. And this is another evidence in which the 145P was downregulated when we compare normal versus tumor cells. But let me now go into a series of data in which we deeply analyze this locus and this two macroRNAs. So one approach that we did is just to look whether macroRNA can be long-term predictors of breast cancer risk. In this case, what we did, we studied this ordered prospective study. So ordered prospective study has been built at the National Cancer Institute in Milan. And what they collect was from healthy women, most of the biological fluid that they could detect, or blood, the urines, some of these. In those women, more than 11,000 women, that were healthy at that time. And they, of course, followed for more than 20 years how these women. So they, of course, had a number of women that developed breast tumors, a number of women that remained healthy, and they have this biological fluid that if you look at the idea to look for long-term early predictor can be a precious material. Of course, we analyze all the characteristics of these women, all the information that they have, that they have collected, and of course, test whether all, all these could in some way be a confounding factors and eliminate all these start we had the possibility on this group, on this postmenopausal group, uh, I don't go on to the details. Of course, there is a group of women that develop the tumors also in the premenopausal state. But there, the analysis is even more complex than what I will show you for these uh, postmenopausal women. Of course, there are some drawbacks in, in this analysis. Of course, we 
analyzed the expression of macroRNA in the Buffy coats of these healthy women. That was one of the few materials we could have because, of course, we cannot get normal tissue from healthy women. So that is one of the limitations of our analysis. We provide the Buffy coat, maybe we are looking at something that is not so relevant in the breast tumors. And that is the material we had, and that's what we decide to do. So through <coughs> the profiling that we did with the Agilent platform, in which we compared 133 cases, so women that develop breast tumors in postmenopausal age, versus control. What are the controls? The controls, of course, are not matched, but are other women that were selected on the way that they were rather similar to those women that developed tumors. And through this analysis, we came up with a group of macroRNA. Yeah, I'm going to show the top ranked up and down regulated macroRNAs. And you see there is a large group of down regulated macroRNA. This again is additional evidence that maybe down regulation of macroRNA is an early event as we are looking at Buffy coat of the healthy women. And there were also a group of the up-regulated macrame. So <coughs> again, when we did a dendrogram for the top rank of the macronase, we found both the 145-5P and the 145-3P. Let me also say that I don't want to say that these two are the most important macrame out of these 20. So it's a matter of choice, it's a matter of how to deal with this group of macrame. And of course, we decide to look at this locus because we also are used to investigate the function of these two macronas. And with the strong help of two, or I would say three group of bioinformatics that had worked on this cluster of data, we were able to identify three cluster Along, among the top 20 ranked macroRNAs. And if you look into them, some of these, the pathway that are most significant, the predicted pathway of this cluster of macroRNAs, as many of the pathway that are altered in breast cancer, as well as in other tumors. But these provide us with some of the confidence that, again, we have some other, some suggestion. Then, of course, we move to validate this finding. How we could validate this finding? One possibility is to have the 133 tumors that were, uh, were originally analyzed, not only the Buffy code, but the tumor. That's turned out not to be so easy because these 11,000 women were spread in many uh, institutions all over the uh, Varese, Milano, so we could not easily collect, we are still collecting. What we could do was to see whether this modulation of macroRNA that we found in order were also uh, uh, reflected in many of the database for macroRNA expression and for breast cancer. So for instance, we asked at the metabric analysis and what we came with the metabric analysis was the one of these, the 145-3P expression in the metabric database as an impact on the disease-specific survival, not the 145-3P. Then we start to look whether these two macroRNA were also down-regulated or follow what we saw in our audit analysis in many databases. So you see these are some of the databases that were uh, already existing, including what we did at that time, and with different platform, and we could say that what we see in order to the down regulation of the 145-5P were also present in other databases, different set of tumors. This was also for the 145-3P. So all this information provides us the confidence that we, what we were uh, seeing in this uh, Buffy code could be not something uh, very artificial, but something that could have a certain relevance when we compare this data with the pre-existing database, at least in the terms of the modulation. So it means that these two macroRNA were down-regulated. 
and provide us the idea that maybe were two macroRNAs that were very early for some reason uh, modified. Then of course, we move to uh, uh, the cell culture and see how we could uh, handle the functional or the biology of these two macroRNAs. And it was already published that, that the 145 5P when you restore the expression in different breast cancer, there is no impact on the proliferation, but it's mainly impact on the migration. And we were able to show and reconfirm this result. But surprisingly, when we analyze the 3P, we see that these have a strong impact on the proliferation and no impact on the migration. This may suggest that again, this is a rather unknown macroRNA. There is not much in the literature. There is no uh, any work that I remember uh, in at least until a few months ago about this macroRNA. This in some way sounds similar to what we show for the 10B locus. So one seems to be the 10B, 5P seems more involved in the invasion and the migration, while the early arm, the 3P, seems to be involved in uh, in the inhibition of the proliferation. So maybe this is what we believe is the long-term predictor of breast cancer risk on the way that disabling the proliferation maybe is a very early event in the transformation of a breast, uh, of a breast cell. And this is where we are now. We are trying to collect additional information. We are also screening for the targets of this 145 3P and see whether we can in some way uh, identify genes or see whether uh, some of the uh, proteins or the targets of this macRNA can also help to identify this uh, uh, um, long-term predictor of breast cancer risk. And the last project that I want to touch goes with uh, one of the critical problems that there is in the oncology today, and this is the problem of metastasis in general, but mainly when we move to the brain metastasis. So all the metastasis, as you know, are very difficult to handle, but those that metastasize in the brain is additional complexity due to the uh, difficulty of barrier and other to employ treatment. So I will try to convince you that this MIR-145 5P that already has shown to be a tumor suppressor may also play a role in the metastatization. So the loss of its tumor suppressor activity in some way favor brain metastatization from lung tumors. Uh, again, uh, let me say that there are three types of tumors that preferentially metastasize at the brain. The most frequent is the lung tumors. There is also breast. There is also melanoma. These are the most uh, uh, frequent tumors that metastasize. There are, of course, ovary and other tumors, but the frequency of uh, brain metastasization is uh, less evident than for these uh, three tumors. Um, and, of course, uh, the material that you can detect and that you can have is a little bit reduced because not only the brain metastases are surgered, not all depends if they are single metastases, usually are surgery. If there are multiple metastases, there is no way to surgery. They undergo directly. Uh, that's a also to tell you that the, the number, of course, the material that we can analyze, despite we are a big cancer center, is, uh, is uh, rather small. Uh, of course, the aim of what was, was again to compare in the homogeneous series of the patients affected by non-small lung cancer, profiling of both the primary tumors as well <coughs> as the nature of the metastasis, brain metastasis, see where some macronae were and see whether this can have a sort of influence. And this is the collection we were able to uh, recruit at our institute, and then also we had some additional uh, material just to, to increase and enlarge the, uh, the quality of our result. So initially, what we have was a group of 13 lung primary tumors 
and they matched brain metastasis. <coughs> of course, then we had in our analysis additional control, so we have a normal brain, not matched the normal brain, and we had matched the normal lung. Then, of course, we could also increase the number of the brain metastasis with additional 16 brain metastases, of which we did not have the primary tumors. Because, as you know, sometimes the patient is a surgeon in Italy for brain metastasis, because it's believed to be a brain tumor. Then when they surgery, they realize that it's a brain metastasis, and only after they identify the primary tumor. At that time, there is no way to surgery the lung because the patients had already metastasis. That's why you don't have always the match of the lung tumors because there is no reason to, to surgery them. Then, of course, we have also a small number of brain metastases of melanoma and a small number of breast cancer with the idea to see whether the modification that we could find in this set of analysis could be also reproducible for other type of brain metastasis. <coughs> so this was our analysis that, of course, profiling then was subjected to many bioinformatic approach and hierarchical clustering. And you see that the PCA is in some way able to uh, uh, separate primary lung tumors from brain metastasis. Let me say that when usually we do the PCA from normal and uh, uh, tumors, from normal tissue and tumoral tissue, you really get a very uh, uh, clear separation. So macRNA are very powerful in separate tissue, normal tissues versus tumoral tissue. Here, of course, uh, is less efficient because we are analyzing tumors versus their derivative metastasis. There is a still a robust separation that say that the metastasis, at least for this group of macRNA, are rather different than the primary lung tumors. Of course, we always we go through a validation by real-time PCR as additional approach to validate this data, and these were confirmed. And again, we focus our attention on the 145 because there were already some evidence that suggests that 145 down regulation could be involved in some way in, with the metastasis, either by some evidence in cell lines, in cell invasion, in cell growth, and so on. So we start to uh, analyze different aspects of the, so first of all, we see that you see in the brain metastasis, this is the normal lung, this is the primary lung, this is the brain metastasis. <coughs> there is a degree of down regulation that is more evident and more marked when we look at the brain metastasis. This is also for brain metastasis that are derived by melanoma and for brain metastasis that are derived by breast cancer. This suggests that maybe this event is something specific from the brain metastasis independently from the initial tumor. Then, of course, we see whether this is again from all the metastases or just for the brain metastases. At least it does not occur for this subset of liver metastases, which we could analyze a subset of matched colon cancer and liver metastases. We did not get any difference in the 145. Again, it's indirect evidence that suggests that maybe it's an event that occurred not all for the type of metastasis. And of course, because we have this, as I said at the beginning, these are in cluster, these are two, we were also going and see whether other macroRNAs from the 143 for the 145 were modulated, and we came up with only the modulation of the 5P. So at least in this subset of patients that we analyzed, for these four macRNA, only the 5P was modulated in the agilent analysis as well as in the profiling. Then, of course, we again try to understand how this down regulation of MIR-41 5P occurs. 
And again, we had the chance with the PRO sequencing to test in some of the, these uh, specimens that we used for the profiling. And you can see that there is an increase of the uh, um, uh, methylation when we move from the normal lung, match the normal lung, primary lung, and brain metastasis in this uh, subset of matched patients. Of course, we could check again the uh, methylation of the GP island of one of these regulatory regions, and again we could. So through a combination of a pyro sequencing and MDIP, uh, in a group of these patients, we were able to show that at least a part of this uh, down regulation occurs uh, through the methylation. Then, of course, we move to cell culture. And again, we employed lung, uh, well known for our 1299 cells, uh, uh, breast and melanoma cells that are known to be metastasized cells. And we again use DNA methylation inhibitor or the HDAC inhibitor as borinostat 5 acetidine and check it for the expression. And we see that this expression of the MIR-145 restart once we treat these cells. And again, no effect we were able to show on the 143. This again start to give us the confidence that if we re, uh, re release this methylation, we can restore the expression of this macro -NA. And then, of course, uh, uh, <coughs> we did again the GPI land is methylated. We could also do uh, the promoter acetylation is increased after the cell. So in the cell lines, we did the some of the analysis that we can easily modulate and that is more difficult. That's with the idea to have a cell system in which we can move and investigate the molecular details that we cannot do in the embedded samples that you know are there, but we cannot do more than what we are doing. So and then we start some of the experiments. So this is wound dealing assays and transwell assays. And again, when we overexpress the mimic for 145, we see that there is a, a strong reduction. So, so there is an, a, a role, a critical role, when we restore the expression. Also, if we treat these cells with such, and again, we restore the expression, I'm sure that this does not occur only for 145. Many other will be uh, releasing the methylation, but this is again to complement our finding that uh, there is a, a tumor suppressor activity when we are able to restore the expression of this macroRNA. Then again, the question is how this macroRNA can contribute to the metastasis. And that's we are following two approach. One is to look for targets that have been already shown to be target of 145 that in some way could be involved in the metastatization or in processes that are involved in the metastatization. And the other approach is to look for a novel target of 145, so undiscovered or what are putative. So we don't have at the moment data on the novel target. What can I show you are data on known already. So you see these are two critical components of the four that I have already shown for the mesothelioma. And EGF receptors that, again, is one of the critical components that is used in the treatment of no small lung cancer. It is also employed for uh, brain metastasis, some specific type of brain metastasis from lung. And you see there is an increase of the expression of between primary lung tumors and brain metastasis. That again suggests that maybe even this down regulation and the up regulation of these two targets occurs already at the level of the primary lung tumors. And that's justify why this is known as a tumor suppressor, maybe there is a gradient that turned the 145 also playing a role in the metastasis. Of course, if we will be able to discover target that are not modulated in, of 145, they are not modulated or altered in the primary lung tumors, but are modulated, altered only in the brain metastasis, give for sure will give much more support to the idea 
that 145 is not only a tumor suppressor of macRNA, but is also a pro uh, metastatic. I mean, uh, an inhibitor of metastasis and the loss of 145 is a promoter. So other molecules that were shown here were overexpression of mix, uh, uh, degrade EGFR, CMIC. So some of the known were re easily reproduced in these uh, lung cells once we were able to overexpress. So this is what suggests, suggests that 145, as well as for other macRNA, concomitantly uh, modulate a different target. So there is a sort of multi-target specificity of one macRNA that can concomitantly target different genes and through that can, of course, participate. Of course, once we gather proof that this uh, target can be on the axis of 145, is to knock the expression of CME, COCT4, NCADR, and MOOC1, and see whether the interference of this recapitulate the effects that we have previously seen with the 145. This again, together with all the transactivation assay using the UTR of this uh, mRNA that, of course, we have done, and also, again, suggest that there is a sort of link between the macRNA and its uh, target downstream. And that's what we approach here by knocking the expression of MIC and Caderin, MOOC1, and OCT4. Uh, we could recapitulate the effects that we see once with the 145. <laughs> so in the, in, in the literature, and we are investigating a little bit this issue, has been reported a crosstalk between MOOC1 and the internalization and expression of the EGF receptor. That again, we consider a critical component because there is a, a growing use of inhibitors in the treatment of lung tumors, and there are ongoing trials also for the treatment of brain metastasis. And we are a little bit collecting evidence that one upon expression of 145 phi P, the EGF receptor is mainly accumulated in the cytosol. So this again what says that the response to EGF is aberrantly impaired. So you see phosphorylation of EGF receptor in a specific tyrosine is lost upon 145. Uh, and a downstream effector of EGF receptor has been reported to be CMET, and this is lose the ability to transactivate CMET. So this suggests that there is a, a, a large ongoing picture once we lose the activity of this macRNA 145. And this is just resumed in this uh, uh, final uh, cartoon. So what we want to propose that despite we are looking at the loss of the tumor suppressor activity of the single macRNA from our signature, we really are impinging on many pathways because these can simultaneously, I say simultaneously, maybe it's not simultaneously, maybe occur at a different step, but let me simply say simultaneously, can target different uh, uh, pathway or can impinge in different pathway. And all this picture that is aberrantly <coughs> down-regulated or modulated by the loss could be restored, at least in part, if we are able to restore the expression of the MIR-145. There are ongoing a clinical trial for lung brain metastasis using, uh, uh, using uh, I would say, epigenetic drugs. So those drugs that that's can provide a molecular basis, or I would say one of the molecular bases, why it's useful to approach these brain metastasis with these epigenetic drugs. Because at least for the group of the patients that we analyze, we can selectively restore the expression of 145 from this uh, locus and from this. And once we restore this, we have a major impact because we can, uh, uh, we can reduce or we can uh, 
interrupted this aberrant activity of this already known target, uh, let's hope we can describe. And through this, of course, we have impact on many, on many, on many patterns. So the idea is that instead of to use drugs that target selectively each of these pathways, if we use an epigenetic drug, maybe we can obtain a similar effect. That's, of course, is hypothetical, but just to give you the idea that despite today there is no way to use this macroRNA as a therapeutic drug for all the reasons that we know from the delivery, conceptually they can help us to have some upstream regulator that control many pathways downstream that usually we afford using for each of these pathways some specific drug, intelligent drug, uh, therapy drugs, uh, personalized medicine as we like, but we have also the possibility through the discovering the analysis of the non-coding maybe to touch one of these and impinge severely on many of these pathways. So in conclusion, we identify, uh, I would say, a group of macroRNA that differentiate brain metastasis from primitive tumors, and this has been done mainly for us in lung. Among the macroRNA 145 is one of those down-regulated. It appears as a gradient in its expression, uh, seems to be under the control of epigenetic events, such as methylation and acetylation. Uh, confirm that the tumor suppressor activity is an inhibitory effect. And again, this could be uh, uh, really, uh, I would say, not only a biomarker, but could represent a way how to implement the therapeutic approach to brain metastasis. And of course, we now are in progress with some in vivo experiment in which we would like to see whether we can reproduce brain metastatization from the lung, it's not so easy. There are many metastasial systems starting from the breast, but not from the lung to the brain metastasis, and see whether, of course, this overexpression on MIM-145 can have some, I would say, therapeutic approach. So these are the people that participate. All our projects are, let's say, multidisciplinary project. You know, always we have the surgery, the pathologists that are very important in this case, two uh, surgery, the thoracic surgery and the neurosurgery. Uh, this, the audit study, again, was done with the group of Franco Berrino and people at the McMaster University. Uh, and also we had the chance to cooperate with the Weizmann and through it to have the access to the Metabrick database. Thank you.